In the final segment of this lecture, I want to take what we've learned so far and apply it to the Brayton cycle and jet engines. And it's my understanding that you'll have already done this in your Applied Thermodynamics course a couple of weeks ago. So just as a helpful reminder, The Brayton cycle is the ideal cycle for gas turbines, and that includes jet engines. So if we draw a TS diagram and draw on three pressure curves, then the cycle looks like this. the ideal cycle. All right, so it's goes around this way. And here we have compression from one to two. We have heat addition at constant pressure from two to three. We have expansion from three to four. Though in a jet engine, we typically split this expansion up into two regions. So if this first curve is P1 and the second one is P2, the one in between is PTE, pressure at turbine exit. And we can separate this expansion into the expansion in the turbine of the cycle and the expansion in the nozzle. This delta T is the temperature increase total temp stagnation temperature increase in the compressor, heat transfer rate Q dot in goes in here, and this temperature increase is delta T T due to combustion in the burner. The temperature difference from the peak temperature to this point is the stagnation temperature change across the turbine. And this temperature change is the stagnation temperature, sorry, is the temperature change across the nozzle and at the bottom we have the heat removal from the cycle. So in a closed system, we would model the Brayton cycle as just being a compression, heat addition, expansion, and heat rejection. But we divide the expansion phase for a jet engine into the turbine expansion and the expansion in the nozzle. And basically, how we know where this division takes place is that the amount of power required to drive the compressor is exactly equal to the amount of power that will be withdrawn from the turbine. And because of the fact that we're modeling the working fluid as a perfect gas, we can say that the total temp or the stagnation temperature change in the turbine is equal to the stagnation temperature change across the compressor. And so the excess power, which is the mass flow rate times delta T sub nozzle, is used to accelerate the fluid in the nozzle and produce thrust. 
So to recap, the turbine drives the compressor and the turbine exit pressure is higher than the ambient pressure. So if we look at what's going on in the nozzle then, We have PTE entering and P nozzle exit, which we'll say is equal to P1 at the exit. Now, if we assume that the flow is isentropic inside the nozzle, then we can say that P turbine exit over P nozzle exit is equal to the temperature at turbine exit over the temperature at nozzle exit for the gamma over gamma minus one. Now, if we neglect the kinetic energy coming into the no uh, nozzle so that PTE and TTE can be taken to be stagnation quantities, then we can write PTE over PNE equals one plus gamma minus one over two the Mach number at nozzle exit squared to the gamma gamma minus one. And since we can determine this pressure based on the work required to do the compression, and we know that the nozzle exit pressure is equal to the ambient pressure, we can get the nozzle exit Mach number. And then when you combine the nozzle exit not Mach, the nozzle exit Mach number with temperature at the nozzle exit, it's possible to get the nozzle exit velocity. where the temperature of the nozzle exit is a function of the temperature at turbine exit and the Mach number at nozzle exit. Thus we can get the jet velocity and this is the key to calculating how much thrust is produced by the engine. So that's a quick crash course in a refresher on all the thermodynamics that we should need to be able to proceed with analyzing the behavior of aerospace propulsion systems, which is what we'll do next time.